It's good to be with you on this Sunday morning uh, with the opportunity to open up the Bible and see what might be helpful to each of us today. People my age uh, remember things of days gone by better than they do things right now. I'm sure nobody else in this room has that problem. <clears throat> So I brought up a couple of things to might uh, test our memories here this morning. Uh, last week on the, the 20th of July would have been the anniversary of something very significant in this country. I can give you the year, but that will tip you right off. 1969. What happened? What's that? Man on the moon. Yes, the walking on the moon. Do you remember where you were when that took place? I do. I was uh, over in uh, kind of the middle of Des Moines in a house with the youth group of the West Side Church of Christ. And we watched it there after youth group, I believe, in church that night. So um, this one uh, you probably don't remember, but boy, do you like it. It's what happened on July the 23rd, and I forgot to write down the date, but it's something I think most everybody in this room is pretty wild about. It's the invention of ice cream. A fellow by the name of Edward Menchus on July the 23rd, and like I said, I wrote down or failed to write down the date, but um, just kind of some fun things to... Uh, get uh, this thing up here going this morning. Uh, growing up in church, I'm sure you, if you had a chance to grow up in church, have lots of memories of those days. And uh, I've thought about that a lot. I hear a lot of people's stories over the years and still hear them of their bad experiences in church. I'm sad to say they do happen, but there are many good experiences in church. And I remember as about a 9, 10, or 11-year-old sitting there in church because, see, they hadn't invented children's church in those days. So you, you sat in church with your parents. And uh, you got to remember, too, that in those days, at least in our circles, sermons weren't 20 minutes. They were 50 or 60 now, when you're a 10 or 11-year-old kid sitting there, you're watching the clock. And if it's fall, I'm wondering when he'll get finished because at noon, the football game came on. <laughs> now, in those days, there was only one football game on Sunday. One football game all the week, except if there was college on Saturday. So uh, that was uh, kind of one of the, remember, uh, the memories that I have had of sitting there in church uh, of course, there's things my mom and dad did to kind of entertain me, but it finally finished, and we could go home and have uh, dinner and watch the um, ball game if it was fall. And uh, while watching, though, in the church, I remember distinctly over here on the left-hand side of the stage was this picture of Jesus kneeling at a big rock. Anybody ever see that picture? Yeah, kind of with standard equipment, I think, in a lot of churches, wasn't it? It was later to be figured out by me, after my Bible knowledge grew a little bit, was that that was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and praying on that very pivotal night of his life. Now, it seems like in our church, that picture gave way some years later to another great picture, Jesus walking with the two on the road to Emmaus. But you know, as a kid, you see those things and you think about them, but it wasn't until uh, later on did I really understand what that was all about. And what was really interesting and fascinating that in 2017, Joyce and I got to sit in the garden there where they claim would be the place of the garden there in Israel, and just, just think a little bit about that important night in his life. And of course, Jesus was at the crossroads of his life. I mean, it was there that he was praying because he had to make up his mind if he was going to go ahead with uh, 
the mission that was set before him. He knew what was coming. The word made flesh that dwell among us that John writes about was about ready to go to a cruel cross and die there but be resurrected. And it was a weighty and a heavy night. It was, the, it was the pivotal time in Jesus' life. And I want you to think about this this morning because we've all been there. Not something as important as what Jesus was going through. We've all been there when there's a decision that has to be made. And you're struggling with that decision. And, practice, and I'm sure this has probably happened more than once in your life because it has in mind but just like Jesus we're at a place where we've got to decide something the real big one is are we going to do the will of the father because that's what he was facing and every one of us in this room today if you profess to be a follower of Christ has done that and probably will do that some more so this morning, I want us to think for a minute. I kind of got ahead of myself here. Look at that. We want to look at the scripture passage to set the pace even a little bit better. Of Romans chapter 15, verses 30 and 31. It's on the screen there for you. This is uh, toward the end of Paul's letter. And here's what he says. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. This is the great Apostle Paul. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and the uh, contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there. Paul says, join me in my struggle. By praying. Wrestling in prayer is what I've called this this morning. And uh, I, I want us to think about that because we're going to look at some issues along the way. But uh, I want to say kind of up front that uh, we're not supposed to struggle with God because we have kind of that mistaken notion that we are, we're wrestling with God or struggling with God because he's withholding something that I really need. And that's really not true. And you don't have to have much Bible knowledge to know that. The struggle, I might as well give you the big idea right up front. And um, the struggle is with Satan and with ourselves. So I want us to look this morning a little further at this. And understand it a little bit more. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10, 11, and 12 uh, tell us this. Uh, in 11, I believe it is, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. So that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The King James uses an old word, wiles. W-I-L-E-S. And I remember the preacher saying, what that word means is Satan has investigated you and he knows your weakness. Uh, schemes, whatever the case may be. We know he's full of them. But it also goes ahead to say that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and rulers of this dark world. Somebody has called that, we're up against Satan's mafia. Kind of like that. You see, Satan wants to hinder your prayers. That's why it's a struggle. And in fact, it's been said that the thing that, the, that Satan hates the worst is people, Christian people praying. He hates it. It weakens him. He doesn't like it. And, you know, daily prayer is very important for us, folks. Now, you all have your schedules, and you've all struggled, or you've developed, or whatever the case may be. But uh, the minute your feet hit the floor, Satan starts the battle. Now, let me just say up front, I'm not trying to scare you this morning. 
If you're scared, read 1 John 4, 4, which says, Greater is he that is in you, Jesus, than he that is in the world. But I want you to be aware of the fact that we are in a formidable battle for the souls of men and women because of what Satan wants to do. You see, helplessness is not a hindrance to your prayer life, but rather an incentive. Helplessness is not a hindrance to prayer, but an incentive. And I want you to center your prayers upon Jesus, and Satan will not hinder your prayers. I don't know whether you're familiar. There, there's some prayers that you can use during the day called centering prayers. Any of you ever been familiar with that concept of centering prayer? Well, it's, it's a good one. And here are some I would suggest for you. You see, you find yourself uh, in a very critical time in the daily routine that you might not even have a chance to get beside, get away by yourself and pray, but you can use these centering prayers. Uh, my former uh, doctor, I guess, used to do this. He never told me this, but one of his co-workers did, and I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. I would expect it, but uh, I just didn't really know. But there's all kinds of them. But here's an example. One of them is, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. That's a centering prayer. You're going into something. You're going to meet somebody. You've got a transaction to make. There's some things going on. Maybe you're going to be fired. I don't know what the case might be, but it's a centering prayer. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Or another one is, uh, in fact, uh, Francis of Assisi, I, I guess, used this. My God and my all. That's your prayer. Or uh, Teresa of Avila, uh, a cross or a picture can help us center if you have a chance to, to go away to a place where that might be. Or Brother Andrew, if you've read his story there, uh, Father, what would you ask of me? Uh, now Amy Carmichael, you need to read about Amy Carmichael if uh, you don't know who she is, an amazing person. Oh, Lord Jesus, my beloved, may I be a joy to thee. And one I just heard this morning is, merciful God, extend your mercy through me. Those are called centering prayers. They might be helpful to you, they might not. But I'm just saying, we need to have prayer as our weapon against Satan. And so regular times of prayer are important. Now God doesn't need them, but you need them. Regular times of prayers. Well, what was Jesus' method of prayer? Well, uh, Matthew 14, 23, Jesus, it says, went up into the hills to pray. Well, that would indicate he probably got alone in a secluded place. Mark chapter 1 verse 35, it says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus went to a solitary place to pray. Again, solitude. Luke chapter 6 verse 12, these are just going through the synoptic gospels and, and how the writers recorded some of the life of Jesus, but Luke 6, 12, one of those uh, days Jesus went out into the hills to pray and spend the night praying to God, and guess what? The next morning, he selected the 12 apostles. All night in prayer before he chose those guys. Do you see the importance? Do you see what our Lord has left for us? You see, again, my point is looking at the prayer life of Jesus and uh, the times that he did it. And, and, and I think we really need to pay attention to that. To, to be quiet in prayer in a place where you won't be distracted. Now here's another thing. You're not feeling good. You go to the doctor. You go to the doctor and of course the uh, the nurse comes and calls your name, and you go to the room, and they do the usual things. You've all been there. And uh, after the nurse, then the doctor comes in. And so you begin 
in that appointment to tell the doctor what's going on. And you unfold this big story and you tell him all the particulars, he or she, and then you walk out. You didn't even take time to hear what the doctor was going to say about or what the diagnosis might be. You just talked and you expected the doctor to listen, which is a part of any good appointment, but you've got to stick around to hear what he's got to say about how, what he'd recommend for you. That's kind of the way we treat God. You see, a part of prayer that we need to learn is yes, prayer is talking to God. But prayer also is listening to God. And in those early morning hours, in those times of solitude, is where God will help you see the things you need to make your life more productive for him. I have a book in my library that was given to me by a dear Christian lady. And a few of you in this room might know her, but not many. She's gone. And uh, I read that book, and I can tell you a whole story about some of the things that happened upon reading that uh, book. Uh, this gentleman, th this is a book that's 90 years old. <laughs> it's copyright 1931. And here's what uh, o, o. Halsby is the guy's name. A big O, and his last name is Halsby. Listen to this. It is the work of the Spirit to convict us of sin. That's right out of John. The quiet hour of prayer is one of the most favorable opportunities he has in which to speak to us seriously. In the quiet and solitude before the face of God, our souls can hear better than at any time. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and see if there's anything in my life that I need to change. You read it over. I've kind of butchered it just a little bit, but you know what it says. Or you remember the song. We used to sing the, the hymn quite a bit which was which, which just that. But search me, test me, lead me in the way everlasting. Now Colossians chapter 4 verse 12, I'm just going to call attention to this. This is really interesting here because Paul in the closing of the, the last chapter of that great little book of Colossians, he talks about a man by the name of Epaphras. Now there is in your Bibles a man called Epaphroditus. Well, that's over in Philippians, which uh, Jason has been leading us through. But there is Epaphras that's mentioned right here. And he says, Paul commends him because he was wrestling in prayer for them to stand firm on the faith to be mature and grounded in Christ. Now again, I mentioned people have the mistaken notion that we wrestle with God and he withholds his gifts from us for as long as possible. People think that God is made to change and if he does, we have won the battle. And you don't have to know a whole lot about the Bible to know that that's not true. Now James chapter 1 verses 5 and 17 says, Does anyone lack wisdom? Let him or her ask of God. And then verse 17 says that uh, all good things come from God. And uh, it's just a, a powerful verse about how uh, God does provide if we just ask him. So I just kind of want to take just a few minutes here to remind us of three Bible stories that might help us in this whole thing. The first one's in Genesis 32, 22 through 32, and it's about Jacob and Esau. Now, I tell you what, if you want to learn about human nature, read the Old Testament. Read the Bible, period, but read the Old Testament. So Isaac and Rebekah 
have these two boys, Jacob and Esau. Now Esau's a outdoors guy, a hunter. Jacob, he likes to help mom out. And so these brothers are together, and um, one day mom and uh, Jacob come up with an idea how to get dad's blessing, because you see Esau is older than Jacob. He's supposed to get it. That's the way God wanted it, or at least that was the plan. God had other thoughts in mind, but in mom and uh, son contriving this plot to cheat brother out of his birthright did take place. So Jacob got the blessing, which we could talk a whole lot about. Okay, that was God's plan anyway. But anyway, it was not done properly. And uh, those boys, uh, in fact, mom said, hey, you better get out of here because Esau is going to kill you. So they take off. Years later now, Jacob has a great big family, and uh, he hears that Esau is coming to get together with them. The guy you've cheated in the blessing of life is coming. And so Jacob, this is the background for Jacob taking all of his family to this spot, and he crosses over the Jabbok River, and uh, that night wrestles with God, wrestles with an angel that represents God. And you can read the story. It's a fascinating story, but the place where he does this is called Penal or Penuel as an alternate reading, and it simply means face to face with God. Now you read that story, Genesis 32, 22, it's about 10 verses there, and you'll find this whole thing. But the blessing and, of course, Jacob wanted to know who this person was and all that. And you can read it, and you can study it, and it is fascinating, but you'll still walk away from it wondering, hey, what really is going on here? But there was this struggle, and there was this wrestling. And uh, so it's, it's a piece of uh, the Old Testament that is not easily understood, but we know that some of the Bible characters, like even with Moses, when Moses hid in the cleft of the rock and God passed over because you couldn't see God or you would die. So that's a piece to this whole thing. But I want to use it for the struggle and the wrestling, but really the wrestling is with ourselves and with Satan that we struggle with here in our lives. And here are some issues uh, that we have with our prayers. We're selfish. Our hearts need to be emptied and we can be filled with God's Spirit. Uh, the love of ease. We just get plain lazy sometimes and that's why our prayer life doesn't amount to anything or we quit praying. I never forget a phone conversation I had some years ago with a young mother who called me and told me I'm going to be leaving my husband and kids. So this is a phone conversation, not person to person. Phone conversation, and in that conversation we talked about several things, but one of the things I said, have you prayed about this? And she said, I haven't prayed in a long time. So therefore, I wasn't surprised that Satan got his foot in the door of that situation, and ultimately, that's what she did, and we have all the ramifications that go with a, a breakup like that. And so I think we need to remember the struggle that we all have is to persevere in prayer. It is hard. If you're praying like you should, it's hard work. But it's work that you need to do because it's our connection with the Heavenly Father. 
So that's that Old Testament story there. You read that, and it's, again, you'll come away from it amazed, perplexed, but it is fascinating. Second one is Jesus in Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28, and it's with a Canaanite woman. Now, a Canaanite woman was not a Jew. So here, all of this is going on among the Jews, and Jesus is there ministering, and this lady brings her daughter that has a demonic spirit. And it's really interesting because she comes with the daughter and Jesus, this is an example of timing, Jesus wasn't ready to heal her. You see, his mission was only to Israel at that time, but after persistence, he did heal. Because she confessed basically Jesus Christ, but he was trying to bring out in her a few things like who she really was, who he was, and what he could do. And it deepens her faith. And sometimes our prayer lives are tested to deepen our faith. And of course, the last one is probably uh, more familiar to us than about any. But let me say one last thing here. This woman that he cast the demon out of the daughter, was helpless, and she felt that Jesus was her only hope. And that's what he wanted to draw out, was that particular fact. So sometimes when you're praying, you've got to remember some things can be going on here that God might want to do when you think your prayers aren't answered. Now, Oswald Chambers, and if you haven't read Oswald Chambers, you're missing a great treat, says there's no such thing as an unanswered prayer. You think about that. John chapter 11 is the raising of Lazarus. Jesus was good friends with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They lived in Bethany. Jesus would go up there and rest many times. And the word comes that Lazarus is dying. And, of course, um, Jesus ultimately went. Now, he delayed in going, but he went. And um, they, they, they said, oh, Lord, if you'd have just come sooner, this wouldn't have happened. And what Jesus was trying to get them to see again is his timetable and ours is different. His purpose and our purpose is different. And what he wanted to do was to raise Lazarus, and so that's why he didn't come. And he spoke those words, Lazarus, come forth. And he was raised from the dead to show who Jesus really was. So just three examples here that might help us to understand a little bit about the struggle in prayer. You see, again, the wrestling is not with God, but with ourselves and with letting God be in control. Now, I don't think I have to convince you or spend too much time on that point because we all have our desires and we all have uh, many times we, in fact, uh, our prayers can be telling God what to do. And that's not the purpose of prayer. And uh, we, we see that all the time. And so we must remember we are helpless. And once you re realize you're helpless, then your prayer life will accelerate. And we got to remember God's timetable is what it's usually all about. And God wants to get the glory not you and me. And we can rest in the fact that God is on the scene and God knows exactly what to do. You may have said it. I've had people say it to me, God left me. Well, we all know that's not true. God is everywhere, God is in control, and God cares about you, and God loves you. What we've got to own up to is Satan is working really hard to thwart your Christian life and mine, 
And the more opportunities we give him, the more he will get in our face and get us off track as Christian people. And that's why your prayer life is important. It is a struggle that we all find ourselves in. But that struggle, again, as Paul says, is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the powers, and those in dark places. Satan's mafia. They're working. Satan hates prayer. And so we need to be tuned in to that whole thing and remember again. Back to the picture that I started with. Jesus in the garden. We've all studied it. We've read it. We've heard it preached on. But again, Jesus was at the focal point of his life. And the intensity was so great that it says he sweat blood. And they tell us that medically that can happen with great intensity. Our Lord was at a critical place. Each of us has a Gethsemane experience. Uh, for many years, Roy Weiss was the campus minister at the University of Missouri and did a phenomenal job winning students and professors to Christ. Great ministry. He's, he's long gone. But he used to have an article. He had an article one time in the Christian Standard called Packing Up to Go to College. He talks about how you get kids Christian kids ready to go to college so they don't fall prey to the devil was what it was all about. But one of the things he says is they have to have a Gethsemane decision to be properly prepared to go to college. And all of us folks need that. We may have it more than once. But we do need to consider at various times in our life, Lord, what do you want me to do? And when through prayer and counsel and study, you find out it's a great feeling to know I've crossed over. I've been to Gethsemane in some ways, but that I have decided to do what God wants me to do. So this morning again with this passage of scripture with this idea of struggle, wrestling in prayer, just remember how important those prayers are. Remember what a great opportunity we have that we can even talk to God. That ought to permeate our life. You mean I can talk to the creator of this world? Absolutely. And you need to just be as somebody sitting down across the table drinking a cup of coffee or a Coke or Pepsi or whatever else you have. Maybe an energy drink. <laughs> it's three in the afternoon and you're about ready to go under. Whatever it is you do, that's what God's sitting across the table from us. And the creator of the universe is interested in you. The devil has just done a number on people and getting them to think God doesn't care for you. In fact, God has rejected you, and he hasn't. And once we read our Bibles, we'll find out that that God who created also listens to little old you and me.